as my colleagues mentioned, Hyperloop could potentially change the future of transport and it also can re revolutionize the way we live, work and travel. But one of the huge problems is that a huge part of society is still not aware about the Hyperloop and especially the next generation. And this is where the role of outreach, science outreach program, programs comes in. To speak, to speak about innovations and share the knowledge so that next generation will be, um, will be inspired to engage with STEM. Good evening all, I'm Deepti Rapte from India. I have just finished studying second year uh, biological sciences at the University of Edinburgh. I joined Hyperloop team uh, in two months ago in March 2019 when I had no idea about Hyperloop. But when I heard that Hyperloop could potentially cut down the journey time between Edinburgh to London from four to five hours to only 45 minutes, I was so fascinated. Then I started reading about Hyperloop and I also learned a lot from my team members through different workshops we did and activities we did. Then these days speaking about Hyperloop or sharing about similar innovations like Hyperloop has been a part of my daily life. And this is also one of the common messages we share with the students whom we met in our workshops. That to be a part of any innovation, you don't necessarily have to be a science or engineering student or be the most brilliant person on this earth. But what you need to have is a learning mindset. And my team, a Hyped Outreach team, we do the same. We inspire the next generation to engage with STEM-related subjects through Hyperloop. So yeah, as I mentioned, we are a team of five, uh, around five students uh, of University of Edinburgh, and we are a group passionate about uh, creating awareness of STEM-related subjects through Hyperloop. So the question is, why did we need outreach team uh, in Hype Society? We wanted to address the shortfall of UK engineering graduates via highlighting the role of STEM in society, and especially the place of engineering in society. So currently, we are targeting GCSE students. Also, we wanted to highlight, uh, sorry, also we wanted to bring inclusiveness and diversity in STEM related subjects and we wanted to promote collaborative, creative and open-ended learning. We are doing this via using Hyperloop as a teaching context because it combines scientific understanding with economics and also urban planning and sustainability. We are, uh, since we started, we have started two, uh, two, since two years ago, and since then we have been doing three projects, the workshops, national competition, and uh, online course. And now I would like to share about these projects in detail in my next couple of slides. So the workshops we are doing uh, are distributed in three stages, design, build, and operate. And uh, the aim of this workshop is to cre uh, create awareness and highlight the wider role of STEM in society through Hyperloop. And what we are doing is here, second year, sec secondary high school students, they learn about Hyperloop and the role of infrastructure in society by engaging in different activities, in interactive sessions and uh, some science, uh, basic science experiments whilst discussing the stages involved in designing, building and operating Hyperloop. So in the design stage, we uh, discuss about what is infrastructure and what are the factors that can make a city attractive. Then in build stage, we discuss about the pros and cons of, cons cons of constructing Hyperloop. And also we discuss about uh, how any construction of any new infrastructure can be affected or affect the environment. Then in the operate, uh, operate stage, we, I'm sorry. And in the operate stage involves mostly basic science experiments related to Hyperloop, such as magnetic levitation. Uh, last year, we ran these workshops in different schools, science museums in Edinburgh and Glasgow, and in, uh, with the Royal Institution masterclasses in Newcastle and Beamish Museum, and also with, with uh, Elutech London. These are some of the images of uh, the workshops from Newcastle and Beamish Museum. And also recently, we have started collecting feedback from the students so that we understand that what went well or what could be improved to keep improving the material we deliver to students. The next project we did was national design competition. The aim of national design competition was to challenge primary and secondary high school students to design the uh, ultimate Hyperloop journey. It was uh, the objectives of national design competition were to, uh, for students to understand the process involved in innovation of STEM and understand the importance and need for safety and inclusivity while uh, designing or constructing any infrastructure project. Also, it helps students to uh, develop interdisciplinary skills. Some of the 
focuses of national design competition were, but not limited to looking into efficiency. For example, how can we reduce the time to get people in and out of the pod? Or inclusivity, how can we make sure that Hyperloop uh, station and Hyperloop pods are accessible for people of all kinds, such as people having disabilities or children or pregnant women? And we were really surprised to get some entries from China as well. These are, uh, some teams had put a lot of efforts and time, so it was very impressive to see that. These are some of the highlights of uh, national competition. So as you can see in that image, one team had proposed a foldable uh, rigid origami structure, which, is, uh, which was basically cons uh, considering natural factors into consideration. And uh, it could accommodate different uh, temperatures, humidity, and uh, weather. And then the another team had proposed the, gold, the golden uh, ratio, which was basically uh, promoting more of green, uh, greener place around the Hyperloop station. So as you can see in the image, the external design of Hyperloop station uh, signifies a conch, which ignites the importance of environmental conservation. And some uh, teams had made some cool websites and apps to book the tickets and make the journey comfortable. So it was really impressive to say, uh, see these efforts from primary and secondary high school students. And the winner of this competition was a team from Macau. Then the last project we, have, uh, we are working on is uh, online course. It's commercial and open online course. It is mostly student-led and it f provides a deeper understanding of Hyperloop and also uh, deeper understanding of Hyperloop and the future of infrastructure, which are highly relevant topic in our today's changing world. And uh, right now, uh, last year we created the basic outline of online course, and this year we are more of uh, going to further develop the content, also find more industry and academic partners, and uh, uh, confirm the sorry, confirm fundings for filming. And this course, is, uh, this course is suitable for a wide range of people from students, secondary high school students to industrial professionals. So perhaps this could be of interest of you or maybe interest of your, for your children or relatives. Now I would like to share some of the key goals for a uh, hyped outreach team for the next year. We definitely want to keep inspiring the next generation to engage with STEM and Hyperloop. We also want to run our workshops all over the UK through different school visits or events. Then we want to raise the profile of engineering with professional institutions. And last but not least, we also want to recruit more people in our team because we have been doing all this great stuff having like five team members. So we would be really interested to recruit more people. So if you are interested or if you know anybody could be potentially interested, then please let me know after the presentation or get in touch with me. Uh, to achieve our key, go uh, key goals for the next year, we want to reach as many people as possible, especially those who cannot have easy access to uh, exposure like this. So we are going to keep collaborating with the Royal Institution. We also want to uh, hope to uh, collaborate with the schools and festivals such as Orkney International Science Festival, Dundee Science Festival, and TechFest Aberdeen, amongst others. To improve our participation and networks, we have already started to have conversations with maths outreach team who are, uh, help, uh, who are keen to help us develop some maths-focused uh, activities in our outreach program, as well as there, we could potentially get some volunteers to help run our workshops. Then we are getting uh, advice from Edinburgh Future Institute on what we could potentially include in our online uh, platform. And then we are getting uh, trainings from the Royal Institution about how we can engage with students during the workshops. Now this is the last part and my interesting part of my, for me from this presentation. Uh, I'm really glad to share that within such a short amount of time and with such a less number of uh, team members in our society, we have not just been able to uh, come reach to the students in the UK and the schools to the, uh, in the UK. But we have also been able to motivate students from the University of Edinburgh who can take this idea forward, sp speak about Hyperloop, share about Hyperloop and such innovations in their home uh, countries. So the project called Hype Macau Summer Program, it's also very similar to Hyped Outreach Team, but it is mostly focused on Southeast Asian countries such as uh, part, uh, part, like students from India, Indonesia, China, and Thailand, amongst others. And what we are going to do is we are con uh, creating some videos which are related to Hyperloop and the role of infrastructure in society. 
and we will be passing those to uh, all the students from these different countries. And then in the month of August, we have a final competition, which basically looks into its it's for Southeast Asian countries, and it looks into how we can make Hyperloop accessible for people uh, having different needs. And uh, they are also providing three internships to the students from the University of Edinburgh. And I'm very excited to work on this because I'm also going to be one of their interns. Then the next project we are doing, uh, not we are, sorry. So I recently uh, have started working with my two team members from Hype Team on a project called Leapfrogging Beyond Borders. There has been documented evidence that developing countries can adopt modern technologies and uh, move forward rapidly without going through the intermediary steps, a, a notion called leapfrogging. And these developing uh, countries can, like, through technologies such as M-Pesa, mobile transfers, and uh, solar panels, they're easily able to pr make progress in all the domains such as education, economics, transportation. And so our aim for this uh, project is to create more awareness about how the STEM technologies can uh, help such develop, developing countries live, frog, and grow. For this, so far, we have received a student experience grant, and also we have confirmed 12 volunteers, including me, uh, to do these workshops in six countries uh, in Sub Saharan Africa and India. And I'm really, work, uh, really enjoying working on this project so far. So, the last question is Is the next generation ready for Hyperloop? My perspective on this is yes, because I have, like, we have been able to get a lot of interest and potential in this pro project so far. From my own experience, in Hype Team, there are more than 200 students who are spending their time on, like, free time on Hyperloop. And also, when I wanted to find volunteers to work on leapfrogging beyond borders, I was easily able to find interest from students, which shows that actually young generation and uh, youth is really interested to take part in innovation and contribute in it. What we need is programs such as outreach who could, put, who could go and speak about this and in, um, inspire next generation to engage with STEM. And definitely Hyped Outreach team is uh, really excited to inspire the next generation for Hyperloop and the innovations to come. Uh, this is our uh, social media profile, so if you want to uh, stay up to date with that. And uh, we have, our society have been able to make all this progress mainly because of the support we received from our funders and supporters. So huge thanks for that. And also thank you so much for um, joining us today and listening to us. Thank you EICC for ho hosting us today. Well, thanks very much to all our speakers this evening. And if I could uh, just ask you to take a seat, we'll start our question and answer session. Um, there are two roving mics out there. Uh, and if I could just ask if anybody has or any questions that are asked, if you can wait till the uh, microphones reach you, then that would, that would make it a lot easier. So, who'd like to kick off? This one there, John. As he first, sorry, have you got some lights here, guys? Hi. Bring down the lights. Can you hear me? <clears throat> What's the risk for a um, uh, you know passenger travelling at seven hundred miles per hour? Any risks to the passenger? <coughs> sorry, could, could you repeat? Yeah. Could you repeat the question, please? Yeah. Thank any, you. Any risks to the passenger travelling at seven hundred miles per hour? Oh, well, so the, the, the problems don't really come with how fast people travel. It's usually with the acceleration only. So in, you know, in planes, uh, we are used to traveling um, at least half of what the Hyperloop um, is uh, proposed to, to travel. So the, the, the biggest problem with traveling at high speeds is how to get to those high speeds, um, because acceleration tends to make us um, uh, very nauseous. Uh, so the Hyperloop and the, the proper journey and the times includes limits to how fast we accelerate, which is 0.5 uh, g-forces, which seems to be a very acceptable um, speed of acceleration for many people, uh, a speed which would not make you nauseous and would not make you, you know, uh, sick. Okay, thank you. Next question, this gentleman here. Yes, how, how do you manage to maintain the pressure in the tube if you've got multiple pods? I presume if you've got a 300 mile 
uh, tube going from Edinburgh, London, or 400 mile, that you, you'll have multiple pods in there. So how do you manage to maintain the pressure with pods starting off at different times and uh, creating pressure waves and uh, fluctuate, fluctuations in the pressure in the tube? Uh, well, the, the idea is that whenever there's an, a loading or an unloading of the pod where you have the passengers coming in and out, uh, that's the only point that, would, that you change the pressure. So the tube stays depressurized. And then whenever you get to the station where you're, when you're unloading, that part is depressurized, it opens. That's when the passengers come out. And then passengers come back in, that part seals, you pressurize it again, and then you send them. So it wouldn't be the whole, the whole tube, the whole system that's depressurized. That would be very economically uh, <laughs> just unfeasible. But yeah, it would, it would just be the part where you're unloading. And like, that's a good question. OK, thank you. Any other questions? I think there's one just up there. John? Yeah, OK. Uh, how do the pods respond the to extremes of cold and, and heat in terms of external temperature? Uh, well, the, it, well in, in terms of what we'd be facing in, in the tube, it is a vacuum. It is a vacuum tube. So the temperature stops uh, well, having, having that idea. So you don't really have that risk of very high or very low temperatures when you're in, in a vacuum. Pre the, the only difference would be the, the pressure that you have in the pod. And well, you, you'd be sure to implement very rigid pressure vessels so that whenever, whenever there is a big pressure difference, the, the inside isn't affected. So basically, they would deal well with those situations. OK. And maybe just at the back there. Have you considered claustrophobia and people having panic attacks once they're in there, kind of stuck? That, that's, a, that's, that's a great question. So we, I don't think the, the current proposals looked particularly at like all groups of people. Um, so it's mostly right now, because all, everything is just up in the air, models, proposed suggestions. It doesn't really cater towards um, you know, specific needs. So right now, I would say no, uh, but it's definitely something that I imagine would make people uncomfortable. OK. Just there. Yeah. Hi. Uh, can you tell me a bit about capacity? So if perhaps the, uh, the Indian uh, example is a good one that's coming up, uh, how many pods can be traveling at the same time between the two endpoints? So in the uh, Edinburgh London example, uh, how many pods can you have travel at the same time? What are the practical limits to that? Is it two? Is it ten? Is it a hundred? Yeah, so, uh, it's, it's definitely intense. So I, I haven't found any hard limits. Uh, no one has really tried to come up with a specific number. We do know that it's, um, it's definitely not only one. Uh, that they should be spaced out in about, um, I think, 20 seconds, one after another, uh, to half any minute. That's the ideal time where you would be able to just send them through for ma maximum capacity. Um, but there definitely is going to be problems in terms of how fast you can load people. Uh, but it's definitely intense, tends to, you know, to 200. OK. Gentleman over there, John. Hi. You mentioned that the initial cost estimates have now risen quite markedly. Is that due to land costs, technological constraints? I just wondered if you could comment on why those costs have increased. Oh, yeah. Do you want to? Uh, well, I can only speak for the technological part. Uh, the, at least there, there's a, th there doesn't seem to be that big of a cost when it comes to the pods and the technology. More, the majority of the costs tend to go into like the tunneling and getting the permits and regulating everything. So yes, the majority of the, the increase in costs would come from what, what we've now found to be the, like how, how much it would take to do the tunnels. But the pods and the technology, it doesn't seem to be that big of a problem. Yeah, and, and just to add on to that, it's um, the, the initial cost estimate comes from Elon Musk himself. Uh, he's known to be quite optimistic about costs. So Tesla hasn't made profit yet. Um, but um, it's, it's mostly about uh, being real in terms of um, you know, budgetary restrictions, overheads, how efficiently we are able to um, put things together, you know, when we, when we have to uh, put together teams of engineers and teams of uh, social scientists and uh, make these long stretches, it just 
comes together to be a, a, a lot, lot more than the idealized version of, we'll just have the ideal cost estimates. Um, it doesn't work. Okay, we've time for another couple of questions. <coughs> Up there and then down here, John, afterwards. I know one of the main issues with uh, high-speed rail travel is vibrations in the ground. Does maglev uh, completely remove that, or is it less than it, or is vibration an issue? Uh, well, the, the issue, when it comes to, to levitation, magnetic levitation is actually incredibly effective for this, because, well, there's, there's a point where if the ground was to, was to vibrate and, well, your, your rail gets closer to, to the magnets, there is just like an immediate immediate response where it, it would like it would go up slightly slightly more the one issue I can see would be with the with the tracks and the tubes if that was to vibrate and that was one of the things that was put in the first paper which was what would happen when when for example the the metal that you use heats up and well whenever there's like earthquakes and that comes more to the to the tubing and how you how you make the tunnels uh, but that would be taken taken into account because it is a it is a fairly, fairly big uh, issue. Okay, and the gentleman here, John. Thanks. Hi there. Um, really excellent uh, work. Loved seeing it. I was curious about the um, the social economic impact. Um, assuming we have uh, one going between Edinburgh and London, and my assumption is it would not stop in between. So, uh, does that? Um, could that potentially have some kind of adverse impact on in-between cities and communities where they may feel less connected to these economic centres and potentially people start moving away from places like, let's say, um, like Newcastle or, or other, other places that are not connected to this high speed in, higher speed infrastructure? Absolutely. That's, a, that's an amazing question. I, one, of, one part of, of my personal wish uh, for the past year was to think about the adverse uh, impacts of what this might happen. And the, my mistake was I actually skipped over one of my slides. The proposed route includes connections to Be um, Birmingham and Manchester within those 50 minutes. Uh, but even then, if you only have four cities connected on this high speed, super high speed rail, tr rail track, um, we, we definitely think it might have many of the same adverse impacts as you, as you would see now. So if there is a, for example, underground tube station built somewhere, the real estate around that goes up. Uh, for Hyperloop, we imagine this impact would be, let's say, magnified, so bigger uh, area around that uh, real estate would go, go up. A lot more people would want to live closer to these stations. Uh, and definitely, there would be adverse impacts in terms of where people would choose to live. If we have Hyperloop between uh, Edinburgh and London, with Birmingham and Manchester in the middle, then it's very unlikely that um, people would, I mean, it would be an additional incentive for people to not live on the sides, right? On the sides where you wouldn't get good connection to Hyperloop, but more towards the, uh, at least the central part of the UK. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, was there somebody else? This gentleman here, John, please. We've got one more question after that. Thank you. Uh, what is the source and quality of the air in the pod for the passengers? Uh, well, the, the air would be the same air as when you went in, so the quality would, would remain the same. Maybe there, there would be a system to have purified air, but nothing, well, there, there would be no effect from the vacuum into the, into the pod. But you, like, it would be an easy, an easy improvement to clean the air and have purifiers. You don't have an aircraft at the moment. There's this question of uh, re re reducing the quality of the air during the flight. Would this not occur? In, in terms of what? Sorry. In terms, of, I mean, it, it definitely would. So it's it it wouldn't be anything, I, at least in the proposals. Once again, because it's not it's not fully running yet. We haven't gotten into the you know nitty gritty details of the actual stuff. Um, so. Things like what is the air quality? I imagine it's definitely at this stage going to be more like air, air, airline uh, air quality. So, so nothing super purified. Just um, yeah, just recycled air within the pods. Okay, thank you. And there's some great questions. Tonight. One more. There we are. The lady up up there. 
Hello, you seem to be doing really great work in each of your respective teams, but could you t speak on what you are doing to communicate together and um, work together for this end goal instead of just as your three separate teams? So what does your collaboration and your communication look like? <laughs> Okay, uh, I'll start and then I'll just uh, pass on to you. So we, it was um, difficult as to work together precisely because what we try to do is um, we try to kind of departmentalize what the society does. So for example, the research, uh, the research, the, the, what I represent, didn't really touch upon the technical issues, uh, even though, once again, one, one wish from us was that we integrated more the technical research with the more economic and, and social research. Uh, we didn't manage to do that this year. Um, also because the technical team, most of 95% of their work over the year really goes into building um, the pot. Um, it takes, you know, as it turns out, it takes a lot of time. So from, from my perspective, we were not able to communicate uh, throughout the society together um, as much as we wanted uh, and just stuck to, to, the, to the research. But what's your, what's your perspective? Uh, yeah, well, really good question. In, in terms of the technical team, we have, we have a very similar feature and end goal, but uh, yeah, as Michael said, it's very difficult when you, when you have these very defined tasks and when you only have one year to build this pod. Uh, at least for now, we are focusing more on the technology. So we haven't been able to take into consideration things such as, well, like having 32 people in a passenger pod or when, when it comes into like the socioeconomic impact, we aren't going into that yet. So we're, we're focused more on the technology. In the future, yes, we, we will have to merge a bit more, but in the past few years, they have been a bit more separated. Hmm. Okay, can I just ask a question? Uh, what advice did you, I noticed in your presentation earlier there, one of your presentations that you, uh, you met Elon Musk. What advice did he give you in terms of your project? Uh, well, he, he was just very excited. Uh, he seemed to be, more excited when you talk about the science part of the project mm -hmm. rather than the kind of Making more money. human. <laughs> uh, but well, I didn't I didn't contact him directly. But it seems from the person he he is, it would be just find find work that you find purpose in and yeah. stick to it. And if you find something that you are really interested in and you see something that could happen in the future that could benefit more people, mm. and you stick to it and you really really work towards it, then. I mean, yeah, that's a oh, really good setup. Good. Okay. Well, ladies and gentlemen, could you give our panel, um, Michael, Gonzalo, and Dipti, a round of applause, please? <laughs> and thank you very much for uh, attending this evening's talk. Um, um, and the very best of luck to you three um, in the up and coming Hyperloop pod competition next month in California. Um, our next EICC sem live seminar is on the 3rd of September on the subject of women in tech. Uh, we hope to see you all again then to hear some of Scotland's most inspiring female tech professionals. So once again, thank you very much for attending tonight. And if you want to um, join us for a glass of wine or a drink outside, you're more than welcome. And you get a chance to speak to our three uh, speakers this evening. So thanks very much. <laughs>